various uh, right. variations on, on this question as well. Is evolution compatible with Scripture, with the God of the Bible? There were variations on that question. A couple things. Uh, you have to distinguish between macroevolution and microevolution. There's not just one monolithic theory of evolution out there. There are all kinds of theories of evolution out there. Microevolution means that there are developmental changes within species, that that's documented. We know that takes place. But macroevolution is, is a whole philosophical view where all life emerges fortuitously from a single cell and all of that, or from the singularity that we were hearing about. But that is not, first of all, no, that's not compatible with the Bible, okay? Uh, second of all, it's not compatible with science. Okay? I want to tell just a little story, a, a Ravi-like story here. I was teaching a philosophy, senior philosophy elective in, in a university at one, one point. And this question of evolution came up. It wasn't a science class, it was a philosophy class. And I said, well, let me just stop for a second and take a poll here of, of the students. I said, how many of you in this class believe in evolution? Every single hand went up, 30 students. I said, fine. I said, now, as a matter of understanding uh, epistemological systems and so on, let me just ask you to tell me here why you believe in evolution. Let's, uh, we can't go through all of the, the tiny details, but let's get the big arguments, the ones that have been most persuasive and most convincing to you. And I went up to the blackboard and I said, number one, there's silence. I said, come on now, we want to evaluate this as a, as a philosophical view. What is it that persuaded you? One student who went on to his PhD in Harvard, who uh, was a very brilliant student, he said, well, he said, one of the arguments that's persuaded me is the idea that all living things are made out of the basic same uh, proteins and amino acids and that sort of things. And so, uh, common substance equals common source. So, and then I started to look at some of the laws of logic and fallacy and showed how that is a fallacious argument, which he saw. And I said, okay, what are the other arguments? I couldn't get any. I tried. I, I, I wasn't trying to intimidate anybody. I said, come on. Finally, the, it came out. That's what I was taught mm -hmm. in my high school biology class. That's it. Yeah. And, that, and that was the biggest reason I could get out of these people. And I said, well, keep in mind, that a question of the origin of life, for example, is not in the final analysis a biological question, it's a historical question. And biologists can pitch in by looking at the, the structures of cells and that sort of thing, but they can't really tell you how it started. <laughs> I, I would simply add that the dominant evolutionary model is pure naturalism and materialism. And uh, the closer you look at, uh, at what is now presented as evolutionary theory, which, which does have its, its own genetic roots right in Darwin and Darwinism, and let's remember that Darwin did not invent evolution. Evolutionary thought was around long before Darwin. In fact, Darwin's grandfather was notorious in Britain as an evolutionist before Darwin was ever born. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, when, when you talk about evolution and you talk about what is taught in the high schools and what you're likely to, to confront in almost any form in the culture, you're talking about absolute naturalism, which means the universe is a closed box, that everything has to be explained in purely natural principles. And you need to understand that that rules out any, any intervention, any sourcing, any creation, anything like that. So the bottom line is, no, if you just need shorthand, please hear me say, evolution is not compatible with Christianity, period. The more you understand Christianity, the more you understand evolution, you'll see the incompatibility. Thoughts on that? <laughs> He's right, they're right. Uh, <laughs> I'm with them. 
But you know, the, the irony of it is, as these men well know, today for any academics in the arena to even say anything like that is to risk completely being an outcast. That's right. Very few philosophies in the world are as bigoted as liberalism. It's hard to find a liberal liberal. Liberal, liberalism is the most bigoted philosophy around today. I made that comment at an open forum, and I got a letter from a congressman, senator, I don't remember his name, and he, was, he took issue with me, he was a liberal, and he, <laughs> he was very upset with the statement. I said, if you truly are a liberal, tell me why it is that in all of the mainline divinity schools, when the conservatives were in control, Students were taught what the counter-perspective is. I think uh, R.C. was mentioning earlier, you know, he was reading many of the theologians in his days, and many of them he would not be in sympathy with, but he had to understand them. Now you try to get a conservative scholar into these liberal divinity schools. See the bigotry that can comes through. I have a friend of mine who did his uh, doctoral dissertation on the Trinity. He is now teaching at the University of Moscow. It was a group of three, I forget if it was Yale or Harvard, one of these two, that disallowed the publication of that dissertation, even though one of the theologians said it was the best treatment on the subject he'd read. But the three, the tribunal rejected it for publication because it was not gender sensitive, and God was referred to in the masculine. This is exactly the story of evolution here. Look at the intelligent design uh, idea. The way it's being hit, as if it's something of imbecilic value, and yet there are some bright minds who are trying to, you know, speak out on it. But then if you find out that Anthony Flew has rejected atheism because it's no longer tenable, you don't read it anywhere in any one of their journals because it's an embarrassment to them. Uh, when Oscar Wilde was dying, he asked for a minister to come because he figured his life of sensuality was an absolute waste. Try finding that out in, in liberal and humanitarian uh, uh, public. You know, they don't, they don't publish all those things. It's the same thing with evolution here. It's the emperor has no clothes. Just to amplify that for a moment, I appreciate you raising that, that issue, because when you think about, for instance, intelligent design, and I, mm -hmm. I even mentioned that a few moments ago, it's not the Christian doctrine of creation by a long no, shot. No, exactly. Uh, it would have been public relations-wise very wise for the evolutionary establishment to have said, this is no threat, because it's actually talking about something antecedent to what we're concerned with to begin with. But they're so defensive about it, they are the true fundamentalists. That's right. They have got to stand up and say, no, you can't even talk about what comes before yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, because it, it, they, they could very easily, they, they, they don't even have good public relations managers. Um, they don't need them because they have the means of enforcement. That's your point. And and if they don't like it, they just change the terminology and fuse it with new meaning. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, two quick questions.